We'll proceed with the uh, program. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce uh, to you the uh, next uh, lecturer, is honor the Honorable Mr. Justice Eugene uh, G. Uvischuk, known to many of us uh, more commonly as the cowboy. If he uh, really expected, no respect from the if he, if he really expected that I was going to be showing reverence this morning, uh, <laughs> you can forget about it. Seriously, uh, Mr. Justice Hewischuk was uh, born in uh, Windsor. He graduated uh, from a local high school there and uh, went to Osgoode Hall in 1964. He's admitted to the bar, and that's the legal bar, in 1966. Uh, in from 1966 to 1972, he was an assistant crown with the Crown Attorney's Office in the County of York, and uh, that's where I and some of you in the audience uh, had uh, the distinct uh, pleasure to become acquainted with the uh, Honorable Justice Uwischek. He uh, was uh, an assistant uh, professor at the University of Ottawa. Windsor first. University of Windsor and Ottawa. Jeez, now he's reading my notes. <laughs> and uh, then it became obvious to him and to others with whom he came into contact that uh, he needed a little more seasoning. And uh, he went to the native province, my native province of Saskatchewan, for some, as I say, some seasoning from 1974 to 76, where he was the director of criminal justice with the Saskatchewan government. He not only did that, but he was admitted to the Saskatchewan Bar in 1974. 1976 until 1981, he was director of the Criminal Law Amendments uh, Federal uh, Department of Justice in Ottawa, and the 81 to 83 general counsel uh, with uh, that ministry. He's published uh, in English uh, some 20 articles involving uh, criminal law. He's uh, participated in uh, drafting and uh, the testimony respecting the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and uh, he has pleaded numerous cases before the Supreme Court of Canada involving criminal and uh, constitutional law, and he has a recent publication entitled Criminal Pleadings and Practice in Canada. For those of you who uh, don't have to practice on legal aid certificates, uh, you might be able to afford it. I highly recommend it. In uh, July of 1983, he was appointed uh, to the Ontario Supreme Court. It's a pleasure indeed uh, to have uh, not only a, a friend and companion, but a, a man who I'm sure will be leaving his mark on uh, the uh, bench uh, for years to come, uh, who will talk to us about uh, evidence and uh, some of the implications that the Young Offenders Act uh, has with respect to, to evidentiary matters. Mr. Justice Ewischuk. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Lucien. Uh, actually, uh, Lou Baloo, as we used to call him, I found out he has another name by the name of Bolio. Uh, that's the Winnipeg pronunciation, but in, in Saskatchewan and other places when we were in the bar together, uh, we called him uh, Lucien Beaulieu. In any event, take your pick, and uh, yes, you're right, I haven't, pol I haven't published in Polish, Ukrainian, or French, but that's yet to come. What I propose to do uh, is uh, probably just walk through some of the applicable sections and to uh, highlight some of the questions, concerns, and maybe give some of the answers, and I don't think I have too many answers. So let's start at section 56 as the basic proposition. I don't know. <laughs> All right, 56 uh, 1 says that the law relating to statements applies. So you have to know the adult law, you apply generally the adult law to the young offenders law. So that means. Uh, Crown basically has to call all the witnesses that are present at the taking of the statement or leading up to the statement. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with the particular case that's quoted uh, somewhere here, I think on, and it doesn't matter, don't turn to it, but on page 95, 
there's a judgment called Midkiff where the mother was present at the taking of the statement and she was not called. I thought that TFO and the adult law basically says you call the people who are persons in authority, all those persons who had anything to do with the uh, particular accused which led up to the statement. That's TFO. So remember, TFO, I, I query whether Midkiff uh, is uh, uh, right, and I'm not sure that I necessarily would follow it if it comes in front of me, although it's from a brother judge or a sister judge. So also keep in mind uh, Irvin, cases like that. That was one of my great losses in the Supreme Court of Canada. I can't, still can't believe it. Uh, <laughs> in any event, any statement unless consented to must be voir dired. Crown must show it's voluntary, even if the statement is made before an officer has reasonable and probable grounds to believe that this person is, uh, an, uh, has committed an offense or before an arrest or detention. So keep that, those ca uh, procedural cases, if I can call it that, in mind. And of course, the other concern to keep in mind is the charter. Uh, even before you get into 56 sub 2, you have to comply with the basic law. The basic law says that on arrest or detention, triggering factors, uh, the officer, um, somebody, a person in authority, but I'm saying a governmental person in authority as opposed to a school teacher or a parent because section 32 of the charter says it applies to government officials, uh, must in fact instruct the person arrested or detained that he, has the, he or she has the right uh, to retain and instruct counsel without delay. So you have to have compliance with the 10B charter duty. That's superimposed because that's, that's law that applies to all offenders, be they young or adult offenders. And I guess uh, Lucien is trying to rename the criminal code, some wit said, uh, and call it the Adult Offenders Act. In any event, we're now into 56.2. 56.2 has certain preconditions leading to admissibility. The basic precondition is in 56.2a that the statement is voluntary. So you're into the question of Boudreaux, uh, Fitton. Uh, I argued a case by the name of Rothman, uh, which followed another case by the name of Horvath. For defense counsel, Horvath seems to say, although it's a, not a unanimous decision by any means, uh, that in addition to not having any hope of favor or, or uh, a type of inducement, the general test, or that in fact, if there are circumstances of oppression, then that leads to a, a situation where the statement is involuntary. So keep in mind the Horvath case as one step beyond the old Boudreaux Fitton test. Now, in Rothman, when I argue that one, uh, Justice Martlin, who has since left that court, said that's nonsense, that's not the law in Canada. So I think it's still unclear whether or not oppressiveness is a circumstance which will vitiate a, a confession and lead to a finding of involuntariness. So it's still an open question, but know those old uh, classic uh, cases. The obvious test is that the person has to know, that's the Rothman case, that the person is a person in authority who's taken the statement. Rothman was a situation where uh, a policeman was planted in the cells, he uh, posed as a prisoner, and uh, the Rothman volunteered a confession to him. The Supreme Court of Canada said uh, the voluntariness uh, rule doesn't apply because it wasn't held out to, to somebody who was apparently a peace officer. So the test is subjective, not objective. Now, so you have to go through the procedural uh, safeguards on the voir dire. You have to call all the persons in authority leading to the statement. You have to prove it's voluntary within the adult test. And then before the statement was made, there are certain factors that have to be addressed to the young offender. Now, even before I get into that, the question might be, when does this happen? What is the so-called triggering mechanism to give these cautions? You normally have now the charter caution, if I can uh, word it that way, the 10B caution. You have the ordinary police caution for adults. Now you have the young offender caution or cautions. 
I would think a very resourceful police department or some crown attorney such as Barbara Ferns will advise them, in fact, how to incorporate all these into one caution. It may be quite lengthy, but it may, in fact, be done in that fashion. Only time will tell. I would think that if you come to a scene where a crime has happened and you have no indication, in fact, of who did the crime and simply pose the question, did anybody do this? And somebody blurts out, obviously, I did it. Well, then you're probably into the sub three, that a statement is made spontaneously, it's so-called volunteered, and it's before you have you have had a reasonable opportunity to comply with these requirements. And I think what you're really, compliance with the sub two requirements are in fact probably triggered, and this will have to be a judicial gloss on the section, as to when the officer has reasonable and probable grounds to believe that the accused has committed this particular offense. Once you get to that, clearly I think you would have if, the, if it's opportune to do it, you'd have to, in fact, give those so-called warnings. Obviously, you don't arrest or detain. Uh, and if detain means chromiac, you're on a virtual, you're, it's a virtual arrest before you have, in fact, those grounds. But if there's an arrest or there's a detention, whatever that word will mean, the Supreme Court of Canada will soon tell us what that means, then obviously you're into, I think, sub two warnings. What are the nature of subsection two warnings? Well, uh, you probably, in fact, what uh, Judge Arshimbo, another Saskatchewan type, he's not from Gravelberg this time, he's from Prince Albert, uh, he and Daniel Prefontaine, who drafted all this legislation, had in mind the incorporation of Jacques and Jensen. So I think, in fact, what you have here is a displacement of that case law. There will be case law, obviously, interpreting sub two, but I think you start there as opposed to starting with the old case law prior to the Juvenile Delinquents Act. But much of it, in any event, is incorporated there. So you have to tell the offender in language appropriate to his age and understanding. Now, that means that the Anderson case decided by Justice Tarnopolsky with relation to the charter probably doesn't apply. A mere repetition of the words are not good enough. Here I think there's a duty to ascertain that the young person being somebody between, uh, from 12 eventually up to 18 in fact understands what's going on. You don't have to do that in the adult system according to this recent Anderson case unless there are circumstances indicating that he doesn't understand. Here I think it's the opposite, the converse that in fact the officer will have to ascertain does he understand that he is under no obligation to give a statement. You're under no obligation to give a statement. You don't have to give a statement. Do you understand that? Yes. All right, next step. May not be quite as curt as that, but the officer will have more time to deal with them than I will with you. Sub two. <laughs> Any statement given by him may be used as evidence in proceedings against him may be somewhat misconceived. The common law police uh, caution, judges' rules in England don't have those words against him. In fact, if you say that, it may vitiate the statement. Uh, here, they put it in here as a warning, don't say anything. Well, in fact, if the young offender does say something, oftentimes the policeman may accept that and let him go. So it may be a little bit of a trap but in any event, you have to comply with the statute. So those words will have to be told to the young offender. Then we get into sub three, the third precondition, that you have a right to consult with another person and you leap in to see to find out who those other people are. You may ask yourself initially, is there a primary right to, cons to consult with a lawyer now that the charter says that supposedly is a constitutional right? This seems to give you a choice. I think, in fact, that the, it's got to be clear that uh, they don't want to speak with a lawyer before they go to the other choice. There may be some case law that comes here, but it's the young offender's choice. Consult with counsel. Now, what is counsel? Counsel here may be wider than counsel under the charter. There were some immigration cases saying that counsel can be an advisor who is not a lawyer, but uh, in the 
uh, charter, they use the word avocat, so it's quite clear it's a lawyer in the charter. Here it may be a little bit wider. Or a parent. Parent is very wide. Uh, it doesn't even have to be a, a natural parent, can be a step parent, can be a, a common law situation exercising some de, de facto control. You look back to the definition of parent in, su, in section two. Or in the absence of a parent, an adult relative, or in the absence of these people, any other appropriate adult. The papers, uh, John Pearson's papers say, what about uh, the girl's pimp? Is that an appropriate adult? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to get in to answer that uh, particular uh, problem. Um, you get in the questions of uh, the right of privacy and consultation, uh, matters of that sort. Um, who is an appropriate adult will be decided, I think, on a case-by-case -case basis. So they have to be told, consult with you, you take your pick. What if they want both? What if they want all three? But Sometimes they may say, well, I want to talk to a lawyer, but I want to talk to my parents as well. Is that really a conjunctive as opposed to a disjunctive? Uh, only case cases will tell us later, probably, as I say, on a case-by-case -case basis. The further right then is that they, they have to be told that they have the right to make the statement in the presence of that person. Some case law would say that person should be a person uh, of the same sex, a little chauvinistic, one way or the other. Uh, here that doesn't say that, we'll see how that's interpreted. And obviously, uh, some people will in fact be less uh, willing to, to make certain admissions in the presence of the parents. This says they have that right, they have to be told they have the right to have that person present. They can in fact waive that right in writing by subsection 4. Very American. We just, we, uh, in fact, dealt with that in the Charter. We, re we decided to reject that. Again, a case-by-case -case basis. Police forces want to come up with forms. They like paper. Well, that's up to them, but at least the Attorney General's Department and that had rejected that approach. It wasn't put into the Charter. So it has to be in writing. Now, after you've gone through all of that, then you get to the last subsection which says that and some of you may recall in the um, Carter Powell uh, book, the orange book on studies in Canadian criminal uh, cases, uh, Chief Justice Friedman of the Manitoba Court of Appeal, um, as I think he then was, wrote an article on statements, confessions, very good article. He deals with this problem. He seems to suggest if, if somebody who is not a person in authority, and that's a very expansive term, that's a police officer, can be an informant, can be all kinds of people, and the, the materials here uh, say, give some examples. Uh, Peter McWilliams' uh, second book on evidence, very good book to have, good source book, also lists all kinds of uh, examples. Once you get past that and somebody, and it's beaten out, out of the young person by somebody not a person in authority, there is subsection 5 applies, which it doesn't apply at common law, although Chief Justice Friedman said he'd throw it out in any event, he'd find some way to throw it out. Here the young offender has the evidentiary burden, satisfies probably balance of probabilities that the statement was given under duress and therefore you can exclude it. So the burden is on the young offender. Obviously the Crown doesn't have to lead evidence to that effect. Duress is not the word coercion. Section 17 of the Criminal Code is coercion. Most law students call it duress. Most lawyers call it duress. You may look to Paquette. Paquette has picked up on some English cases dealing with secondary parties to a crime and used the con Chief J or Justice Martland used the concept of common law duress, which isn't quite as difficult to meet as coercion under Section 17. So note that distinction between common law duress in Paquette as opposed to Section 17 coercion. So that's some of the problems with statements. I'd throw out the classic situation of what if you have somebody like Lucien Beaulieu, all six foot five of them with a beard, he comes out of Gravelbourg, uh, Saskatchewan, and uh, the RCMP officer sees him uh, on the highway uh, uh, with a bloody knife in his hand, and there's a body, and he says, how old are you, my son? 
and Lucien has fake ID in, which says he's 21 and he's actually only 17. Now what do you get, what happens in that type of a situation where the, the young person in fact uh, leads, uh, wrongly leads the peace officer to believe that in fact he's an adult at that time? Well that type of situation as well is not dealt with. There is, the, uh, section uh, two defining young person talks about appears to be. Uh, I think somehow there, this section on the other hand seems to be an absolute bar that you have to meet these requirements. So you may give the charter warning about the right to a lawyer, you may, may give them the statutory, the uh, police caution, but you haven't got, you haven't told them about the C section, about the right to consult with the parent, the other adult and that, so that's breached. Is it necessarily fatal? Well, I'm not sure. The other section says appears to be, uh, can this particular young offender profit by his own loss? Uh, some basic judicial principles will have to uh, apply. I think part of the problem uh, is in fact it sh should have been worded in a type of a may, a permissive, where it will be uh, a shell except in unusual circumstances and I think probably that's what the judiciary will eventually uh, come up with. I think uh, Lucien that basically that's what I have to say about uh, statements. You have to know obviously then uh, what the present law is on, st uh, on statements, and we'll see, we'll see in fact uh, where we go with the type of caution the police will have to give and how they're going to have to give it. It may be that a, an inflexible, although very simplistic caution reduced to writing given in each and every case may not meet it. You may have a 12-year-old offender as opposed to a 17-year-old a very simple-minded young boy who your girl's never been in trouble before as opposed to a 17-year-old psychopath who in fact has committed many crimes in the past and may know some more law than the lawyer. But that, that will have to be dealt with, as I say, on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, if we can then uh, turn to the testimony of parent section 57. Section 57 says that a parent may testify as to age of the, the young offender um, or in fact uh, as to the age of a person that may in fact be a child, a young person or in fact an adult if the question isn't, is uh, if your age is called into question. Uh, there's old common law when Lucien Beaulieu was a uh, young crown attorney, we were much more technical in those days. Somebody would say, how old are you, Lucien? And he'd say, oh, uh, I've always been 39, and he'll remain that way till the end of his life. But the point is, uh, how does he know he's 39? You have no memory of when you were born. Obviously, his mother told him that if she was, uh, on a good day, she told him that. Uh, <laughs> or, or his father. <laughs> now. So that is hearsay evidence. Case law, La Chapelle and other cases say you can make that admission, but you can't call the Crown witness, usually in the sexual cases, and the girl in fact say that I'm 13, where you have sexual intercourse with a female under 13. Can't give that evidence, you have to prove age in an admissible fashion. Well, obviously the mother can say that. She was there for the birth. She may not remember too much about it. Uh, the father, although uh, now they're present, uh, years ago they weren't, uh, I think he could give the age because obviously he can say, well, the mother was pregnant one day, the next day, uh, a week later she came back with a little baby and this is the baby. Now some judges wouldn't even admit that. They'd want the mother to come to testify. That's how rigid we used to be. In any event, this section is designed to deal with step parents, de facto parents, common law situations, even years after the event, these people can, in addition to the natural per, uh, parents, come and give the law. So that doesn't really tell us that much. Go to subsection two and you'll get your records that are generally admissible in any event. Uh, the birth certificate, the bab baptismal certificate, one being a provincial document, generally admissible under the Canada Evidence Act, baptismal certificate, perhaps uh, a record kept in the 
ordinary and usual course of business. Business includes all kinds of undertaking. The real problem that comes in there, how do you correlate the name from that document to the name to the person in court? Uh, well, you can go through similarity of name, uh, circumstance. Uh, a lot of case law saying uh, where the names are similar, you can infer that it's the same person. Now, it may be there are a lot of voyous in uh, Gravelberg, Saskatchewan, and therefore, uh, because the document says uh, Lucien Boileau, and uh, it's a Lucien Boileau, the uh, younger person before the court or a witness, uh, that wouldn't be good enough. But in, I can assure you in Toronto, that would be good enough. If it's a very common name, however, usually you need one other indicia in addition to similarity of names. There is, in fact, in the materials at page 109, a reference to the Long Muir case. All I would say is if you want a citation for it, it's not fully reported, but it is reported in eight weekly criminal bulletin. That's eight weekly criminal bulletin, page 228. It's an Ontario Court of Appeal case talking about similarity of name to draw the inference that, it, that the person before the court is the same person named in the document. All right. Now, sub B will be a very unusual situation. The French is much clearer in this case, Lucien, than the, than the English version. But it's where somebody comes into Canada and the Canadian society then has a record. Although the, per, the young offender, the young person was born uh, in another country. That type of record will be admissible. There are other aids to the, to the young uh, youth court judge uh, sub 3 says basically that you can receive and act upon any other information relating to age that the judge considers reliable. Uh, by analogy, you can look to the bail provisions uh, 457.31e. That says reliable. That allows for hearsay evidence. That's one of the clear exceptions. It's a statutory exception for bail hearings. Uh, it would. I think uh, it's analogous here. Then we fall back to the old chestnut drawing inference from appearance in sub four. So if you haven't got any of that and the person is obvious, unless he or she is a midget or something like that, obviously as a young person, you can infer that that person is under some type of aid, uh, of, uh, under the ceiling perhaps of 18 or so. There are some, uh, then we get into the question, I guess, and that's alluded to here, as to whether or not proof of age of the young offender is an essential element or ingredient of the offense, or is it a jurisdictional requirement? Well, I'm certainly of the latter view, and I always have been. I remember when we'd get people in court, uh, the first thing I would do if the person looked quite young, how old are you? and we'd start from there. Sometimes they would lie to the police, but rarely to the Crown Attorney or the judge. Is that true, Lucian? Yeah. At least at that point. And uh, we would soon verify whether or not that person was an adult, and if not an adult, obviously shipped to juvenile court. And I think it's a jurisdictional requirement that should be dealt with if there's any question as to first appearance. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, once it's sat once the particular judge is satisfied, I don't think the judge is seized with the matter, should make that endorsement satisfied as to age, age being such and such, and it goes on to another judge to deal with the case. At least if it ever comes to me in weekly court, Lucien, it's predictable as to result. Now, we then get into the question of admissions. Uh, you have Section 582 uh, of the Criminal Code. You can look to that by analogy. That's in Section 58. This is wider because generally you can admit questions of facts. You can admit facts, and once you make the admission, you're bound by them. Uh, Castellani is reproduced in subsection 2 to say that where you admit facts, the other side is not bound by those facts and can go ahead and, and prove it and give the gloss to the facts or explain the background. So that's Castellani. There's other cases to say that, in fact, the Crown could admit 
although it appears to say that only the accused can admit their Supreme Court of Canada case law say the Crown can admit Picarello around 1923 or so in the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, this goes beyond 582 because it says you can admit law as well as facts and mixed law and fact. And it really was dealt with or decided or written up before the Park case, another one of Eddie Greenspan's losers in the Supreme Court of Canada. <laughs> Anyways, uh, he'll win one, don't worry, give him, give him time. That was, a, that was a case where, in fact, somebody admitted to the uh, voluntariness of a confession. And Greenspan then, as uh, appellate counsel, ran that to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada said, no, if it's a clear admission, you can admit uh, facts that depend on questions of law. So it really was mixed law and fact. So you can, in fact, do that. It's a type of waiver. It's supplemental, obviously, to Section 582. So that's the part case in the Supreme Court of Canada. 59 is somewhat complementary to that. Section 59 says you can consent to the admissibility of facts, but not necessarily admit to those facts. In other words, let it in, but let the judge draw the inference. It goes to weight. You can argue what weight should be given to it, as opposed to an admission of fact. Once you admit it, you're bound by that admission. You're not in 59. All you're doing is saying, yes, I'll let the letter go in, but I'll argue what weight should be given to that letter, what inferences should be drawn therefrom. All right, 60 then, we get into some very interesting questions here. And I think this is very muddled and confused. I should say that on page 113, and you don't have to go to John Pearson's materials, I think in uh, the, uh, in the uh, Queen's University materials, there's no reference to the Fletcher case. It's a five-person uh, judgment of the Court of Appeal. I say person now, Barbara. Uh, and, and anyways, uh, that's reported now in one Canadian criminal case's third at page 370, Ontario Court of Appeal overruling uh, Art Jessup's judgment in Budden, uh, which is referred to on page 113. Uh, what I should say for, maybe I should explain then the difference. Uh, Mr. Justice Jessup, two to one judgment in Budden said, uh, before a young a person of tender years can be sworn under section 16, uh, the need to uh, understand the nature of an oath requires the further condition of a belief or at least a knowledge of a supreme, supreme being. So there's no such thing as an affirmation for a young person. You have to believe virtually in a supreme being. That involves the, the nature of an oath because that supreme being, when you stick up your hand, comes down and stands beside you and is your witness. That's the theory, right? Uh, Supreme or Ontario Court of Appeal, uh, five men uh, in Fletcher decided no, that's wrong. That you can, the nature of an oath requires an understanding of the moral obligation, the ethical obligation, more than just the duty, one step beyond the duty, but the moral obligation to understand what an oath entails. So that's Fletcher, but you need not believe in a supreme being. Now, that's a lead-in, obviously, then to what Section 60 is all about, as opposed to Section 16 of the Canada Evidence Act. Sixty says that where the evidence of a child, that is, someone under, a person under 12, or a young person, 12 to eventually 18, is taken, it shall be taken only after the, young, the youth court judge, uh, where the witness is a child under 12, instructs. So there's a mandatory duty. Lucien will have to ascertain age when the witness is called. I think it behooves the Crown Prosecutor to say, uh, Your Worship, Your Honor, uh, in, in this particular case, 
uh, this uh, witness is under 12. He immediately will launch into instructing the child as to the duty to speak the truth and the consequences of failing to do so, whatever they may be. You may be charged, you may not, or what, or I'll be very unhappy with you. But he'll, he'll work out a little uh, rote formula for that, I'm quite sure. Now that's mandatory where you're dealing with a child. Where you're dealing with then a young person, 12 or more, then he only has to do it where he deems it necessary. And you'll recall from Sankey, Antrobus, and all those cases, generally the rule of thumb was if you're 14 or more, you need not inquire. You're no longer a child of tender years, although you can. And obviously, if there's mental infirmity, even in an adult, you go through this type of inquiry. So this now lowers the age to 12. It seems to be there's a presumption that you, in fact, uh, know the... Uh, you in fact understand the duty to speak the truth and the consequences of failing to do so. Now, then you have an in interesting interrelationship between 60 subsection 2 and in fact 63. 62 says the evidence of a, of a child or young person shall. Now that leaves open the question of can you have the situation comparable in adult court where the young offender doesn't understand the nature of oath, the oath, but is of sufficient understanding and understands the duty to tell the truth, and therefore his or her evidence is taken unsworn. This doesn't seem to permit it. It's not abundantly clear. But it seems to say, shall be taken, if you want to read the word only, uh, under solemn affirmation. No oath for a child or a young person. Obviously will remain so in adult court, but not in youth court. And then they get, this is the so, form of solemn affirmation. Three says that even where you then have an adult witness, the adult witness obviously will give an oath, so as not to distinguish between where you have a solemn affirmation taken by a child or a young person and an oath by an adult, they both have the same effect. I think that's probably so in front of a judge. I don't think so in front of a jury. I think juries still, uh, the majority will look for somebody to, to take their evidence under oath, and I've seen eyebrows pop up when somebody says, I want to affirm. But that's, that's a total aside. In any event, we're into now Section 61 and the relationship with Section 60. It says here that the evidence of a child may not be received. And again, is it sworn or, or affirmed or unaffirmed? In any proceedings under this act, unless in the opinion of the youth court, judge or justice as the case may be, the child is possessed of sufficient intelligence, number one requirement, to justify the reception of the evidence. Are you precocious enough, you six-year-old child, you? And understands the duty of speaking the truth. Now this is one step short of understanding the nature of an oath or solemn affirmation. And it may be that what they've done is they've collapsed section 16, the two, uh, the question of the oath or uh, unsworn evidence into one here, and I think that's what they intended. So they've reduced it down to the lower level of only being of sufficient intelligence and understanding the duty to of speaking the truth, and therefore you can be affirmed. Failing that, you're totally disqualified. I don't think you can give unaffirmed evidence, so to speak, in juvenile and young offenders court. Now, Lucian will have obviously something to say about that. That then leads into subsection two that says, no case shall be decided on the evidence of a child alone, that is somebody under 12, as opposed to a young person, but must be corroborated by some other material evidence. Ask yourselves whether or not this is a retrogressive step after Vetrovic. This section was written before Vetrovic, so you can have a very precocious 11-year-old, bright, bright kid, who comes to the court, uh, understands the nature of an oath, will explain to you God, Jehovah, whoever up there is, and in fact, probably has skipped a couple of grades, 
and is there, and as an adult, you could convict a first-degree murder on that person's evidence. But here, you couldn't do that, because that person is a child, will presumably be affirmed, but corroboration is needed. So you have a discrepancy or disparity between the adult system and the young offender system here, which, in fact, militates against the believability, the credibility, so to speak, of, in, of, of children. Now, what does corroboration now mean? Does corroboration mean the traditional or Baskerville uh, situation that it must, in fact, implicate this accused in some material particular of the crime? Very tough. In the old days, that used to be an almost impossible hurdle. There's a case called Page, I think it's in the materials, P-A-I-G-E, about 1968-69, Supreme Court of Canada, dealing with this question and applies the old rigid step. Now, has Vetrovic, in fact, qualified that? Vetrovic dealt with accomplices, the common law requirement uh, to have corroboration, although not mandatory, uh, permissive, or in fact, a mandatory direction, but informing the jury that they may, notwithstanding the danger to convict in the absence of corroboration. If there's a statutory requirement, is it different? Or is it, in fact, has Baskerville, Baskerville been so diluted that it really is, you're only required to look for some confirmatory evidence? And if there's some kind of confirmatory evidence, then that's good enough evidence tending to confirm that uh, child's testimony. But it's quite clear here that uh, you're not going to be in the situation analogous to 16.2. And it's a little confusing in the materials, but let me assure you that 16.2 of the Canada Evidence Act says, no case shall be decided upon such evidence alone. The, the antecedent, the reference to such evidence is unsworn evidence. You can have a conviction uh, on the basis of the testimony of a uh, child of tender years where that child, in fact, has been sworn. Sub 2 only requires corroboration, mandatory uh, requirement for corroboration when you have unsworn evidence. But there is further case law, or there used to be case law, to say even where the child of tender years is sworn, then you can give the, or ought to, and I think that's now somewhat uh, uh, diminished by Vetrovic, give a direction that it may be dangerous or unsafe to convict, even though that young person has been, in fact, sworn. Here, I think, in sub two, it's clear that you're dealing with the situation that uh, you probably don't have such a thing as unsworn evidence, but even where the evidence is affirmed, because there's no, it doesn't talk about such evidence. It says no case shall be decided on the evidence of a child alone, even where affirmed, but must be corroborated by some other material evidence. All right, uh, pretty well done, Lucien, if there are any questions. Uh, let me just say that we're back in the section 62 then, proof of service. This allows the service of any document, notice to parents, uh, whatever, um, to be proved, not viva voce, although that always uh, remains, that's a permissible route, but by oath or affidavit. I get back to the question, how do you correlate, how do you connect the name and the document to the name of the person who has to be in court? And I think that's a headache that hasn't been clarified question of similarity of, of uh, names, how do you prove that this person is a parent, all that is based on hearsay evidence. Uh, have they expanded the earlier provisions enough to allow for that type of hearsay evidence as to, as opposed to the age of the child? That, that's quite clearly permissible. How do you get the hearsay evidences uh, in as to who is this young person's uh, parent and such? Most of it is dispensed with because people, in fact, the threat is, I'll call this person down to prove this. Once the phone call is made or 
the uh, parent is, is told that, then the parent usually calls the lawyer back to say, you tell them that I've been served or so, admit it, and so I don't have to come down and miss a day from work. Well, you people, again, will have to iron out that, but you still have the question of identity and perhaps similarity of name. So those <coughs> tend to be, then, my comments, Lucian, in this area. Thank you very much, my lord. Are we open to Surprise questions you. or what? We have about uh, three or four minutes if there are questions. You didn't questions. say uh, votre signorie. Votre signorie. Right. Des questions aussi, y en a, oui. Uh, we have uh, three or four minutes if there are any questions. Yes. Yes. There, uh, I think there's a recent BC uh, uh, court of Appeal judgment, habeas corpus, and uh, there's an earlier case, I think that one's Hill dealing with that, there's an earlier one called Pilkington, all the problems seem to come out of BC because they're the most technical province in the country. Uh, but the BC Court of Appeal has took a fairly hard-nosed approach and say if you somehow mislead the court as to age too bad, uh, Sonny, you stay in that particular court if you somehow lied. <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry. Yes? That, that question has been broached to my mind, and uh, I'm not sure. I think that's going to have to be very considered. Uh, the, there are two ways of approaching it. These are initial requirements on the part of the police. So usually on arrest or detention or interrogation where they have reasonable and probable grounds to believe that this person has committed the uh, offense. Now, he's not in adult court, he's not in youth, young, uh, youth court at that particular time, so why don't these requirements apply even later when you come to court? And I would tell, I, w I would be kind of loath to say that just because you get into another court later on that these evidentiary rules don't apply. There's still evidentiary rules relating to this young person. That's at least initial, uh, and I haven't considered it, I haven't reflected that much, but it has been uh, tossed out to me. I think that would be my initial approach. I know some Crown attorneys say, well, if the guy has lied, then we're definitely going to try to raise him, under 16, I believe the section number is, uh, so that we're going to get the rules that apply in adult court. I'm not sure that these rules wouldn't apply where you have a raising. Yes, he's treated as an adult, but I'm not sure for all purposes. For purposes of disposition and that, but do, the, but do the adult rules, in fact, displace these preliminary requirements, pre-court requirements, so to speak? Okay, well, I think we'll move on. C'est tout. C'est tout. Okay. Merci beaucoup. We really appreciate uh, your Vous taking time out from a busy schedule. I should mention also that our uh, Earl Levy had been uh, scheduled to participate uh, in uh, this particular segment of the program. Unfortunately, his uh, commitments in court uh, militated against that. Well, I was in court too, and I had 12 accused. If he just let me. <laughs> right? Uh, you still can't get over losing those jury trials. Right? <laughs> It, seriously, uh, Mr. Mike. Justice Iwaschuk, we really appreciate the time, and uh, I'm sure that you can tell from the attention that was given to you, it probably not quite as reminiscent of the attention that was that was uh, given to you when you uh, tried to address some juries, but nonetheless, it must be very encouraging to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>